Hello, folks. Thank you again for your patience. We're so glad that you're here with us for growing vegetables for winter storage. We have master gardener jo Joanne Canning with that lovely springy serene background. And um, we are, um, I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Stonema First Nation. You can use the chat to uh, put in your own if you'd like. Um, or just reflect quietly on that yourself. And um, really like to thank the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners for partnering with Burl on this program. Thank you very much for, to Joanne Canning, who's here with us for uh, her vision in starting the program, and Richard Bernier, who is also one of the organizers. Housekeeping items, just a reminder, we are recording the session. None of your faces are visible. Um, all of your questions are going to be captured in the Q&A, uh, so please do use that. And um, that we will, you, we will be able to keep track of your questions well in that uh, format. We will have questions at the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, great. So without further ado, uh, Joe, senior master gardener Joanne Canning teaches and writes about sustainable gardening and food security in our changing climate. She is an ornamental plant enthusiast and was a year-round urban food gardener for over 35 years. She's taught seminars at Van Dusen Garden Horticultural Associations and Garden Clubs, VIU's Master Gardener Training Classes, and the Horticultural Technicians Program at VIU's Payne Center. Her articles and photographs have appeared in Canadian. Uh, U.S. and international magazines. Welcome, Joe. Well, thank you. Thank you, Darby. And many apologies uh, for the, the slowdown. <laughs> um, it happens occasionally. So today's um, seminar is storage crops. And this is um, a, one a photograph I took a few years ago of some of the things that I grew for storage. And uh, let me see now. Um, so here we are, um, that's me. We, we partner with uh, the Vancouver Island Regional Library. We just could not do this without them. And there they are, and about us. So we are uh, a chapter of an international uh, registered nonprofit society. Um, and we're specially trained to teach people uh, about sustainable and organic um, gardening methods. Um, we're science-based and um, that's very, that makes us very different from a lot of people that talk about gardening. Um, the, uh, the seminar is copyrighted. Uh, and uh, the images are either individually copyrighted or taken from public domain with source acknowledgement. So we, we thank the nonprofit organizations for their use. Whew. So that's all done. Now we can get going. So reasons to grow storage crops. First of all, food costs more in the off season. Food is often not available in the off season. Anybody that wants a tomato in January, well, uh, your garden might need a room because you're wanting parts of it to lie fallow or you're growing cover crops. Uh, your climate might not allow a 12 month uh, growth of food crops and you might not want to spend uh, 12 months growing food crops. Your lifestyle might not allow it. Now, the local farmer's market might not have a good supply of the kind of crops uh, that they use for storage, like squashes or horticultural beans. Uh, now, imports also have the larger carbon footprint, and you're trying to stay green, and you want to eat local. And growing your own storage crops is a very good way to do that. And many people don't, don't realize in this climate that storage crops for a lot of the world is the garden, it is the crops. And the things that we rely on, the, the quick greens and things like that are a very small part of what 
their diet is. And uh, um, so we often are not aware of what kind of crops we can store. And we're going to go over that. The other reason you want to grow is the imported crops might be of questionable quality. Uh, I call that water they're using in California for strawberries. When you can grow strawberries so easily, and of course, contaminants, uh, bad water use, bad trade practices. And also this does keep you in touch with local farms and growers and your community. You're out there, you're looking at the real world. It also tastes better. Now, everybody says, oh, it tastes better. The tests show that fresh food grown in local conditions with good nutritional soil actually does taste better. Taste is linked to quality. Quality is linked to nutrition. It gives you a sense that I don't know about you, but by gosh, it's satisfying to harvest your own crops. And a lot of us have some real concerns about food security and growing your own crops is important. This final one, I really, really like. I have lazy neighbors and um, they look out their windows. What is she doing? Well, I'm harvesting fresh herbs in winter. So there. So let's look at the options for fresh storage. Now, here's another picture of some of the preserves I did a few years ago. Um, so there was cabbage and pears from my own tree, peaches from my own tree, applesauce from my own tree, um, wild berries that I made into vinegar and syrup. So those are just some of the storage things that I either fermented or cooked. And we have three choices. We can do it fresh and we can do a root cellar a cold room, a pantry, and one other thing, a fridge, which we'll talk a bit about because it is a little bit in between a cold room and a root cellar. Um, we can dry them either old fashioned in the sun or on the porch uh, or using a dehydrator. And we can also process them to store. We can freeze them, which is a very, very important uh, storage option and you are preserving almost all the nutrition. Uh, and sometimes it's really the only option you have. Uh, you can can them, you can see that in the picture, or you can ferment them. So there's the pantry and it's at room temperature or it's a little cooler and it's dry. You have a cold room, which is cool and dry, and it can be, an unfinished um, room, say in the basement or somewhere inside the house. It can also be in the garage. It can be, now my mother made one of these, a cold room, underneath the stairs going up to the kitchen. And I always, uh, always really enjoyed that because there we were in Kitsilino and she had her above ground root cellar, which was technically a cold room. And uh, that's where all the potatoes and the onions and everybody hung. And a light was hung in it so it wouldn't freeze. You can do the traditional underground root cellar. Now, you see how this is a little different. Um, the top two were, uh, one was dry and cool. One was room temperature and cool. This is cool, but it's humid and it's dark and it's well ventilated to stop the mold. And it uses earth to keep the temperature even. Uh, and I've seen root cellars actually inside houses, but down below. And a friend of mine made a root cellar underneath her garden shed, which I thought was kind of cool. So let's look at choosing the storage crops. And by choosing them, we need to group them. We need to understand. Uh, how we're going to uh, grow them. Because if you don't have correct storage, you've wasted all your time and you've wasted a lot of food. So you wanna decide on what you can make or purchase um, 
uh, given your space, your budget, the temperature and humidity in your home or the yard around you. And I've used um, every one of the methods uh, except um, digging my own uh, root cellar. You can dig a hole in your garden and put a box in it. Uh, you can use an old fridge or a freezer, which is a great excuse to upgrade your appliances. You can use the corner of a garage with cupboards or covered sh uh, shelving uh, that'll stop the dust. That's a great cold room as long as it doesn't freeze. Uh, you can um, uh, go under your porch, as I said. Uh, you can insulate uh, shelving on a balcony or a back porch. You can, uh, in a closet, you can use paper boxes, bags hung on racks uh, with a pallet on the floor for insulation. Um, under the bed, in a box, you can store your squash or your dried herbs. So um, whatever choice that you use, you're going to have other folks that love your, um, your space. So always know how you're going to screen or protect from vermin, whether that's raccoons, rats, mice, squirrels, um, neighbor's dog who wants to dig. Uh, and also decide what crops are going to be stored where. So um, begin to make your spaces before you grow your crops. That's the important thing. So we're going to look at storage spaces, how to group your crops, and then we'll go a little bit more um, into those crops. Now, all crops need rich soil. And that sort of seems a no brainer. But I say this because people forget that Food crops take more out of the soil than anything else. People say we'll have a flower garden or a, a perennial garden say, oh, well, you know, I give it mulch every spring, it grows just fine. Yes, because it's not expiring its whole life and producing super nutrients for you to eat. If you've ever um, uh, eaten the wild bit, of a domesticated uh, food product, you'll discover very quickly they're not nearly as tasty. They're not nearly as filled with nutrition. Um, so always have, always spend a lot, a lot of time keeping your soil well manured, well composted, making sure it's got lots of worms and microbial, uh, microbial life. Um, so worm castings become very important because those have worm eggs in them. And if you see worms, you've got good soil. Um, you also have to have a system of watering. Um, whether you're out there with a bucket or whether you've got an underground system or a soaker system, all these things are very, very important in order to get your crop. Now, the neat thing about storage crops is that um, you can store them in more than one way. Um, for example, um, you can uh, dry a herb or you can freeze it. Uh, and that's like really important in, in say basil where you can, you can freeze the basil. Um, you can cook it and store it. Uh, I would take my zucchinis uh, saute them with 57 pounds of butter and uh, garlic, and then um, put them in uh, bags on sheets. And so we always had uh, that food all winter. And it was the basis for me to make ratatouille or soups. So here's our early planting group. Now, some are short season, some are long season. So the thing to do is to know your harvest dates. Now, a lot of these crops, you may already be growing and, and don't understand yet that you can get more than one harvest from them. Um, at the, I, I think I 
put them in the um, handouts. Um, some of the crops that I've grown um, that have two or three um, harvests. Uh, beans are a very good example. I grew what's called Q blue, and they were uh, like a French fillet bean that was purple. And when it was young, you could snap it fresh into a salad. You could grow it as a regular bean and you could freeze it. And then you could let it mature and you had horticultural beans all from one cultivar. So if you have a, a food that you like, look into that. You may not be using options you already have available. So that's our early planting group. April, no. Um, Mid-season planting group, and that's our biggest group. It has um, the most to offer, and you can see some examples here. Um, and I'm just looking at my notes here so I don't forget. And the late group, as you say, oh, I can plant it very early. So now we're looking at July which is when you plant your winter vegetables, if you're going to overwinter them, uh, or you can do a little bit of both. For instance, um, you can, uh, brassicas are your cabbage crops. You can plant your kale then to overwinter, yet you can pick some and freeze it, or you can dry it to make kale chips for the kids. So there are several options. Um, the alliums are another one, your onions. Uh, and I, you notice I kept it separate from garlic, which is also an allium. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about leeks or overwintering onions. Fava beans, which were a really a real favorite of mine. So um, you can uh, have a single crop or you can have two crops. If I'm planting, uh, leeks in July. Some of them will overwinter and give me leeks in spring. If I plant garlic in October, it will overwinter. And then in spring, I get the fresh garlic scapes and then I get the bulb. So combining your methods of keeping become very important. And the mid and late groups usually have a long growing season. So know your planting dates. As I say, people say, oh, well, you know, my winter crops, but look at this, you've got to plant those in July in order for them to grow enough to go dormant. And so um, also you have your squashes, which are a mid season group, but they have 110 day growing season. And with squash here um, in the northerly end of the squash realities, it, you don't, don't push it. Don't grow anything longer than 110 days. You can push it to 120. The problem is you won't get the flavor. Uh, I grew, um, uh, as an experiment, a, a green striped kushaw, which is uh, famous in the Southeast of the US for its flavor and its um, ability to make squash, to make pies, all sorts of things. It was tasteless. We didn't have the sun and it was 125 days. It was just awful. So take some time and, and plan, I guess is the best way to say it. <laughs> best way to say it. Um, and also, for instance, with the longer growing season, as long as you have room, say you, you're doing cabbages. So you have a cabbage that has maybe 60 days. And then you have a cabbage that has a longer, uh, a longer date. And you can plant those and uh, still have fresh cabbage. And if the cabbage is going off, real easy. Just slice and dice saute and freeze, or for me, I make uh, sauerkraut. And um, 
my January king cabbages, I used to uh, harvest in January. So I had that in-ground storage, if you will. And a lot of the winter garden is a storage crop. It's just as a doctor um, uh, Gilkison says, it is um, the living fridge. Okay, um, next slide here. Now, here are the conditions for those groups. So you see, um, you want extra nitrogen for leeks, you want a uh, lime or gypsum for your root crops, but no manure for potatoes. You, uh, they're, they're good in cooler soil. Um, and you don't need extra nitrogen for legumes because they fix nitrogen. Again, check for harvest dates and succession planting. And as I was talking about, uh, talking about it before, you can use the first crop fresh. You can use the second crop in the freezer. You can use it, you can dry it. So always keep that in mind because you don't want to do more work if you don't have to. You don't want to throw out a plant that you don't have to if it's going to keep producing for you. Your mid-season group, now you see we need warmer soil. Uh, and again, um, the organic fertilizer, compost, well, well rotted manure. Get used to it. If you want to grow food, you're going to need those things. You might produce for one year, you might produce for two years, but you're not going to produce in the long term unless you rotate your crops and you feed the heck out of your soil. If your soil was your dog, it would be horribly overweight, but it uses itself up feeding the plants that feed us. Here again, add gypsum or lime for tomatoes. Add, always, always add rock phosphate for brassicas for your cabbage crops. Um, put a tent over your solanums. Uh, again, down below here, one squash per mound. You see lots of people with three squashes on a mound. Always put them on a mound. Always put a bunch of manure in the bottom of that to heat to heat them up and then let them run and they produce shade and you got salad greens in the summer that won't bolt. The late group, water is probably one of the most important things. People forget that we get very, very dry in the summer. And just as things are plumping up and getting ready to set their fruit, People forget to water them. They think, oh, look, they're good. Well, no, they're not. And if they're going to be a very late harvest crop, make sure that they've got good drainage. Uh, again, you can plant those in early spring, but always get your drainage right. Um, and think about whether you need that ground uh, again. So let's uh, take a moment and look at crop choices for nutrition. Now, I'm sure by this point, you may be feeling a wee bit overwhelmed by uh, 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 all the things running around that I've been talking about. Um, but I just simply want to make you aware of um, the kinds of things we can do to enhance our food security and enhance our nutrition while we're storing our crops. And here's another uh, picture of mine um, where I've got potatoes, shallots, some walking onions, some garlic um, that looks like some scallions and I've got a yam or two in there. So those were some of my, my uh, bulb crops. So let's look at the basic questions that uh, just ask yourself these things. And if you don't know, find the answer. Um, is there more than one way that I'm going to cook this crop? Well, I know at least 57 ways to cook squash because I love squash. But if it's taking up a lot of time and a lot of space, and there's only one way you're going to cook it, uh, why don't you buy it from the farmer's market? How does this crop suit my present cuisine choices? 
Um, I love a bit of kohlrabi, but a bit, but I'll grow a whole bunch of some other brassicas that I like better. Now, am I going to get one or more harvest or does it really matter? For instance, um, my elephant garlic, um, I really only get the one the one harvest from it. Um, I do uh, have the scapes, but I'm growing it for its bulk. And uh, uh, I grow, I used to grow elephant garlic because it's actually a leek, uh, but it's very mild. So it's great for roasting. Am I going to try new dishes for this crop? Be honest. Unless you're a food head, don't waste your time growing and storing something you're not going to cook with. How long does the crop creep, uh, keep? In the handout, you'll, you'll see on one of the uh, charts that it gives you a thumbnail on how long a crop will keep. And that will mean that when it starts to deteriorate, uh, you're going to have to do something with it. Sorry to interrupt, Joe. Just so everybody knows, um, we'll be sending you the handouts after the session. So not to worry, you haven't missed anything. <laughs> um, and again, what will I do if this crop begins to deteriorate too soon? Some years, it's just not a good year for it. Um, the gods keep us honest. And what am I going to do with it? So know your options. Know your options. Um, well, uh, tonight we're going to have <laughs> baked this because it, uh, it decided to start dying on us. Uh, and we can have hamburgers tomorrow. Now, basic nutrition, um, which some people don't really appreciate um, the kinds of nutrition that storage crops give us. And one of the reasons they give us so much, most of them are ancient crops that people relied on. If you didn't get it, hey, you got sick and died. Um, so what is what are you uh, growing this, this for? Uh, people don't realize that beans have the same amount of protein as meat. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, um, that's very important. Um, or perhaps like my uh, my dearest, uh, he's a carb eater. I look at a carb, I put on five pounds. He looks at a carb, he gets hungry. Um, and so there are uh, storage crops that you eat for carbs or dessert. Some of my pumpkins. Um, I deliberately grew for desserts and pies and breads. Now, um, will the storage me method preserve most of the nutrients? That's a very good point. Um, some storage methods um, preserve better than others. In other words, uh, freezing is better than, than canning uh, in terms of vegetables. Um, is is cooking going to increase the protein or digestible fiber? Um, it's amazing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, now, carbs versus calories. Um, yams and blueberries are both high carb, but they're both low in calories. Uh, natural sugar is not the same as added sugar or added honey. That affects the nutrition and the calories. Drying fruit increases the glucose, which is your natural sugar, and the fructose. And so dried fruit's always high in calories. But, it's, but it is always um, a very good food source when you need flavor and sugar in your diet. And we all need sugar in the diet. Oh, sorry. I meant to uh, um, go on to something else. Um, I wanted to also, um, oh, I can go back. There we go. Um, I wanted to um, just just let you know some of these these things, which you can look up and which are some of them are are in the handout. Um, leeks are two percent uh, protein. Um, now this is just alliums, um, whereas your sweet onion um, is two percent. But your yellow bulb onion, that old cooking onion, that's 6%. And scallions are 4%. So that's quite a range in terms of 
the amount of uh, protein that you're getting in something. Um, a portobello mushroom has 8% protein, but a white button mushroom only has 4% protein. And you may find uh, they taste the same to you, but adding mushrooms to a vegetarian soup gives you more protein. Um, and raw isn't always better. Uh, certain, certain things, when you cook them, increase the protein, increase the vitamins, increases the digestible fiber. For example, uh, kale, um, you get seven times more digestible protein when you cook it. And you get seven and a half percent more digestible iron. So you could slice it in uh, uh, a salad. But even if you don't like kale, you can throw it into a soup. It's fairly neutral when it's cooked. Um, there are some cultivars of carrots that will not release their lutein, um, which is an easily degraded uh, nutrient until you cook it. And um, dragon and red, uh, nutri red, which I've made a list uh, on the cultivars, are two of those. So those, I, I always stored those carrots. They store very well. They don't taste they, they just the bleh, until you cook them and then they oh, they just sing. Um, what else? Um, that's 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 about it. Um, also, um, understand a bit more about your vegetable and you'll understand why they're stored in certain ways, um, like turnips and rutabagas. They're called storage roots. And they develop from a seed. So they're always uh, smooth. They don't have a lot of side shoots. Yams and potatoes are tubers. And um, we grow them uh, vegetatively by chopping them up with an eye and planting that. And so the um, tubers need to be uh, stored in a different way from your other root vegetables. So don't, if you say, oh, well, you know, they're all, they're all roots. We just throw them together. And then you throw your potatoes and your onions together and the potatoes sprout because of the ethylene. So let's look at fruit storage. That's the other group that is very important for us. Um, on the uh, uh, right, um, these are some seckle pears and uh, some of the fruits that I had in my garden that I grew. Um, so I had peaches and apples and pears and figs there, uh, as well as the wild blackberries and my nasturtiums that I just love and they're great in cell. So the, this group, the apples, pears, kumquats, quince, um, they're cellar uh, or cold room. Learn, get to know your apple cultivars. I inherited my apple trees uh, and it took me a while to, to figure out the cultivars. Um, so if you're gonna grow apples, you're gonna need to do a bit of learning. Um, but if you're gonna buy your apples and, and come apple season, you can buy them in bulk um, uh, from your farmer's market. Know what to expect from that apple. Uh, one apple might be cheaper, but it doesn't keep as long. And uh, read up on it. Some apples are more like cider apples. And so they turn brown very fast, but they're very juicy and they hold longer. Um, always harvest pears green. There are very few fruits that ripen off the vine. And if you left a pear on the tree until it was ripe, if you picked it, it'd be rotten in the center. So you pick it green and you keep them separate from your apples. Apples hold, they will go dormant, but they actually, what we, they breathe. Um, we call it respiring, they respire. And because um, rather than go dormant, they just slow right down 
but they let off ethylene. And that will cause your pears to um, go bad. Um, always, always keep them separate. Always, always. Now for citrus and ginger, you're gonna freeze, you're gonna freeze them. And you can freeze them with no blanching and you can zest your uh, citrus. Uh, now you're gonna need electricity for that. But I always have quote fresh ginger because I buy the root when it comes in lovely and fresh and it stays in the freezer and all I do is shave off what I want. Um, and I have fresh ginger from my oriental meals. Most hearty small fruits and berries, and oh, I've got tone fruit, hmm, stone fruit, hello. Um, you're gonna freeze them and they will hold for a year without degrading. And the nutritional profile is virtually unchanged because of the small size of your pieces. You can also can them, um, you can also dry them. And here they take up less storage space. Um, I I use some dried fruit when I'm when I'm making uh, sweet breads and things like that. But I don't use a lot of it, so I freeze most of mine. Um, you're also increasing your calorie by weight, which is fine, and um, but you're losing some of the more volatile nutrients like vitamin C. You can preserve it. It takes up less storage than fresh, it too uses electricity and you gotta learn how to do it. Now I was raised doing it, so it's not a big deal uh, for me, but learn how to do it correctly. When I was very young, I asked my mother, um, someone says, oh, well, you know, that that food is, you know, it's liable to kill you. And my mother, my mother looked at me uh, as we were preparing the fruit, because that's what we would do every summer. We'd go into the Okanagan, we'd load up the uh, station wagon, and then we'd come home and all us kids hated it for about two weeks. And then we loved it all winter. And she looked at me and she said, only a fool would not follow the directions and kill their family. So there you go. <laughs> and it will hold two years if you do it correctly. I never can everything every year. Whatever was cheap and plentiful that year, I would can. And uh, that was that was with with uh, a lot um, stone fruits mainly, and citrus and and I had some things that I like to cook. Um, and um, it would go three years often, but it would begin to lose flavor and color. Um, but all my jars got reused, tops got reused. Um, if it's something that you're interested in, make it your hobby. It's a wonderful hobby. So here is the one chart, and that'll be in your handouts. Just to give you an idea of the protein per cup, what the now these are American, but the Canadian ones are similar, the recommended daily percentage how to store it, and some of the nutrients. Um, here are the conditions that kind of give you an idea in a cold room or a cellar. Um, please read the notes. You never wash off uh, um, um, your root cellar vegetables and what you avoid. Now, end of season tasks. There is a freezer. Uh, upright and uh, chest, and then down below, right? Look at that little one, right in a house. They've, and you notice it's all insulated in there. Um, that's a cold room. And um, this is a root cellar, uh, but it is um, in a house, if you will. You can see how it's all insulated. So let's find out what happens in storage and what rules we need to follow. Remember I talked about respiration. Um, understand what vegetables are dormant um, and what will cause them to prematurely sprout. If for instance, you're getting, this will happen in your fridge. You uh, get a sale on carrots 
and the carrots are in the fridge and one day you pull it out and it's got it's got all these little hairs growing in it. That's because it was too moist. So if you're keeping carrots, you want to keep them cool. But you don't want to necessarily keep them so humid uh, the way it is in the fridge. Now, some fruit is dormant or slow ripening or, or slow ripening. And there's your pears. Um, the other fruit you pick at the peak of their ripeness. And then you push the temperature down and they go dormant. Remember about blanching. Um, if something needs to be frozen, it needs to be blanched because you need to stop the enzymes and um, hold it in suspended animation. Freezing is, uh, I always thought that people made freezing very complicated. Um, but once you get the rhythm of it, um, it's not hard at all. And um, two things that we, we freeze a lot of are tomatoes and uh, beans. Now, my sister always grew bush beans because she wanted her harvest right away, all of it, and then she'd be done and she'd go on to another plant. I always uh, grow uh, pole beans because um, I'm getting a longer harvest, same as, as uh, vine, vine tomatoes as opposed to bush tomatoes, or what they say, determinate and indeterminate, um, because I, I didn't have time to spend a whole day. My sister lived off the grid. Um, I had a job. So, well, she had a job too, but she lived off the grid. So she was there a lot more. Um, I would, I knew how many beans I would get in a week. And so I could uh, freeze two handfuls. Now that's about a pound right there. That's about two pounds. So I could pick those quickly, freeze them, and then go do another chore. Remember, Correct drying, correct curing is success. You're always going to have to cure your potatoes. You're always going to have to cure your squash. You cure your potatoes by dusting them off, letting them get dry uh, at about 60 degrees. You cure your squash by putting it out in the sun, take it out of the garden, put it on the driveway, spray it with vinegar, just regular vinegar that drives out all the earwigs and the bugs and the spiders um, and kills any eggs on it and it toughens the skin. And then you put it in the sun right away and you've got a really good tough skin. Now that doesn't mean that it's, that it's difficult to, to break. It just means that it's beautifully sealed. And when you do that, they'll keep. Ah, how to sort. Look for damage, not just blemishes. They are different. Understand your correct ripeness and curing. We've talked about that. Separate fruits from vegetables because of the ethylene. Pay attention to the details for each crop. They all have different needs. Um, cabbages that weren't in the ground, I cut off and hung. Um, and you always hang it upside down. The water drips out. Tomatillas, which people don't think of as a storage crop, same thing. Treated it like a herb. Cut the plant off, hung it upside down, and, and the, the, those little hats would just curl around the plant and keep it almost completely fresh. And the taste would become mm, just so intense. So when I made um, chile verde or um, huevos rancheros sauce or uh, fresh salsa, the flavor just bounced. The same with uh, tomatoes. When I grew um, uh, tomatoes, I grew a winter keeper tomato and we had fresh tomatoes on, until January when they ran out and they still tasted great. And I think it was you, Darby, that said you had a friend that was eating tomatoes still from overwintering. 
Uh, and my uh, my sister and brother in law, the the same. Uh, they're uh, still eating their tomatoes from last year, and uh, you'll notice on the handouts uh, there's a list of certain things that you can put in the freezer that you don't need to blanch. At the end of the year, I would take all I used to uh, grow, and I still grow them in uh, hanging baskets, um, the uh, tumbler tomatoes. And you get a lot of green tomatoes at the end of the year. Throw them in the freezer. They have a tomato flavor without the sweetness. So if you're making sauces, you can really intensify the tomato flavor without having to use a tomato paste. And then you simply add a little honey or sugar to it to bump up the uh, um, the sweetness. And um, it's wonderful. You can also um, cut them up and saute them and you have uh, fried green tomatoes. Or you can simply cut them up and put them on a sheet and let them thaw in the morning. And then you have fried green tomatoes for brunch. Very, very urbane. Um, so, so you're going to sort each cultivar in piles. Always pick out the best. Be picky. Don't say, oh, well, it went. no, no, be picky. Okay. Your seconds, which are number four group, they can be canned or cooked first in a sauce or in butter, not oil. Oil degrades in the freezer. Or put it in stock and then freeze it. Only unblemished with the skin intact. Blemished with skin intact. So some of those you're going to, the apples, you're going to, the unblemished ones, you're going to put in the kid's lunch because, um, ew, it's got a mark. Um, uh, blemished with the skin intact, you might want to peel for a pie. Damaged, but okay if you eat it soon. Those are the ones that you set aside that you know um, you might cut a, a corner out of them. Uh, you might put them in the fridge. You might leave them in the cold room. But you know that those are the ones you're going to eat first. And then the other ones that are damaged, if you can save more than half, process them in some way to preserve them. Um, if you can't eat, uh, if they're more than half of it is damaged, throw it out. It makes good compost. And if it's damaged more than half the uh, fruit um, or half the whatever, whatever it is, you'll find that the flavor won't be right. And then, uh oh, I made a mistake. Sort number five pile is, oh, that's got to go somewhere else. Always separate them on paper or in a crate. You see in the lower right. There's space between all of those pieces of uh, fruit. There's spaces between all the squash. And one of the things they'll talk about is um, pouring sand around with the top showing. That's one of the things that they'll do with carrots. Is that that they'll they'll uh, um, put the carrot in and then then put in enough sand to hold it up, and then they'll take the other. And put it to hold it up. And so that will keep them dry if your storage space is particularly humid. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here that we can talk about? Um, remember that there is a, da a difference between damage and blemishes. Uh, you got a bruise, it does not go into storage. If you think it's got a bruise, it does not go into storage. Cut out the bruise, eat it soon. Um, I think that, now, once I got um, storing crops on a full-time basis, I began to change what I grew because uh, some of them were just as cheap in bulk as what I could grow. Now, I did, I did a study a few years back, and growing your own food is cheaper uh, because I uh, also uh, um, calculated the labor, the time, the, the, the cost against 
of food uh, in the store. I did the same thing with um, canning and preserving. And depending on the food, um, you can save between um, 40% down to 10%. Well, wow, that's, that's a big savings. And the other point for me was time um, and space. Um, so, for instance, I stopped growing garlic. Why should I grow garlic? At the farmer's market, I could get beautiful garlic very cheaply, and I could also buy fresh steaks. Stop growing onions, except my perennial onions, my walking onions for soups and scallions. I had a perennial scallion. Uh, I grew shallots. They're just as easy to grow, and they're horribly expensive. And buying a shallot, my God. Why would I do that when I can grow them myself? And they take up less room than onions. So I bought my bulb onions. I bought my garlic. I went to grow. I started growing um, the elephant garlic, as I said, because it was uh, a really nice thing to have in my cuisine and it roasted beautifully. Um, I learned that certain crops were perennial. I love runner beans and I grew three kinds of runner beans and they're perennial. So I didn't have to replant them. They just, every year, they, that's, they grew. It was wonderful. Um, I'm just looking to see if there was, uh, oh, I played a lot with squashes. Um, so I only grew one type of pumpkin because of all of them, I could roast it, I could make soups with it, I could make pies with it. Um, I could um, uh, bake it. And uh, so I only grew one type of pumpkin. Why, why grow three when one will do? Um, and it was my, my very favorite, um, which was um, uh, Rouge Vif d'Anton. Um, summer of uh, red of the summer, uh, also called the Cinderella pumpkin. Um, let me see. Um, the other thing that I began to grow uh, more of uh, was uh, ground cherries. So I ended up growing very, very few tomatoes. I only grew the tumbler tomatoes um, for salads, um, grew. Um, plants for winter, my, my keeper plants, and um, grew a lot more tomatillas and ground cherries because it gave me winter salads with some really nice um, flavors. I stopped growing uh, snow peas because I had a bean that tasted just as good in the Q blue um, and gave me three crops and I could succession plant it. So why spend the time with snow peas? So be willing to experiment and, and make those kinds of, of choices. Uh, when I grew squash, because I saved seed, um, I chose um, my favorite squash uh, from uh, each species because squash um, cross-pollinates. It doesn't affect the fruit of this year, but it affects the fruit of the next year. So my squash, I chose for flavor, um, for heirloom, and um, for the ability to not cross with each other. Um, also for um, the uh, how big the seed was inside. Um, I really like the Iroquois um, crookneck. Um, it's the mother of the butternut. And this is another thing that you will find is um, the more heirloom and heritage products that you grow, um, the more success you will have because they have all been developed over two and 300 years and they're very reliable and they're also more tolerant of bad years. So you'll see um, in a lot of my favorite cultivars that they are 
heritage varieties. Not that I didn't grow hybrids, but that I found these older varieties just worked better. Like this, the pumpkin, that was 1700s. The same with the with the uh, blue pod peas, a very odd spelling because they're Dutch. So um, think about that when you're choosing. Plus that the more heritage vegetables that we can grow um, philosophically, um, the open pollinated varieties are um, more friendly to our wild pollinators than the hybrids. They feed the pollinators as well as feeding us. Um, so here's the original picture. 31 different cultivars. Um, it just seems like so much, you know. And um, the only one that wasn't kept in the pantry or the uh, cold room was the, the little watermelon. Uh, on the right there, I uh, froze. Uh, I froze the juice. So um, that seems like a lot, and yet it wasn't in a very big space at all. So the last and most important thing that I want to get across to you is beware of ambition. I've been talking about this and it's like, whoa, and it's a lot. I mean, I yeah, it is. Because I was raised doing it. And before my hands got too arthritic, I did it for, for 20 years. And I learned a lot in 20 years. And one of the, uh, I, I first gardened with my grandparents who were truck gardeners uh, in the Fraser Valley. Um, when I walked through the beans, they were 10 feet high, those beans. So you know how little I was. Um, I wasn't allowed to have my afternoon snack till I finished shelling the peas. Um, so I've been very fortunate um, to have all this knowledge in my head. Um, and you can develop it too if you take it slow and don't be too ambitious. Choose a crop you really like, um, that you're always going for. Do some reading about it. West Coast Seeds catalog is fabulous. Um, I've got at the end um, quite a few books um, and they're all available at the library and they're worth reading. Um, some, uh, I was at a clinic and, and this young person came in with her phone. Um, you know, I kind of went, no, let's look at each other's faces, right? No, let's look at each other's faces. She says, well, it says here. And, and so I said, okay, let's look at this book. So I opened the book. I said, look, this is called a non-volatile storage device. And we looked at the book. And all of a sudden she became fascinated and she began to interact with me. And I looked up and there were three other people standing around. And pretty soon this conversation ensued about, well, you know, I tried this time. Oh, did you really? Well, just everyone turned into a farmer and it's um, really wonderful. And so if you can share those ideas, get into those books and some of the older books are better than some of the new ones because they talk about things in a different way. And so don't be afraid to explore. Um, you'll never know it all. I, I learned that a long time ago. So choose a crop maybe that you already grow and you like um, and learn everything about it, how to store it, the different varieties, and just like turn into like me, I'm a squash nerd, right? Just get into it. Um, and then you have like really weird, interesting things to say. You'll see in the, the big, in the middle of, of the picture here, those are hazelnuts. And, um, I inherited this hazelnut tree, so I had never grown hazelnuts. And so I learned all about them 
And so my very first conversation, matter of fact, I took my hazelnuts to the local fair and I won prizes with them. I was very pleased. And um, someone said, um, are they like a filbert? And I said, well, actually, they are a filbert. It says, but you, but they're hazelnut. I said, no, filbert is just a hazelnut that's late season that ripens after the feast of filbert. And that's why they're called filberts. And uh, so they just thought that I knew so much about hazelnuts. And that was all I really knew about hazelnuts. <laughs> that uh, center, uh, those three bags in the center, that's the black Russian fava bean, smaller, um, a little sweeter, really nice in soups and stews. That's the blue potted um, Dutch pea. That's the horticultural pea. And then you can see the broad Windsors um, in the other, other part there, um, my other fava bean. Um, also, learn how to dry herbs. Almost all your herbs are perennial plants. They can grow in a pot. They're very happy in containers. And there's nothing like fresh food. And I had a neighbor that used to get so ticked off because I would go out and I would pick all my fresh herbs in winter, right? Because most of them, or quite a few of them, are evergreen. And if you protect them a little bit, you've got you've got herbs through the through the uh, through the winter. The others go ahead and dry. Um, and um, you'll always have really good tasting food uh, with those 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 herbs. And and they flower. So they produce a lot of things for you. They produce the beauty. They, they're a little bit of evergreen pot in winter in the sun. Um, the pollinators absolutely go mental over them. And um, our native pollinators, um, even the ones with stingers, they're not aggressive. Um, bumblebees are not aggressive. Um, and feed those pollinators with the, with the flowers. Um, if like if you uh, if you want to use a dehydrator, that's 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 a good idea. Um, there is more of the um, uh, oils in herbs when you cut a branch and then you hang it and then you take a paper bag and you pull it up over so then it just falls into the paper bag and the paper bag um, dissuades bugs. And um, if it's a little damp, it'll stop the mold. Uh, and then at the uh, when it's time to take it down, you you bang the bag and you strip you strip it, and you've got all your your herbs in the bottom of the bag. Um, I had so many herbs that grew. Well, as a matter of fact, I think I grew fourteen different kinds of herbs in my garden, um, interspersed with all my flowers and and things like that. Um, and I had so many when I pruned them, I got a dehydrator and I sold them um, to my local uh, uh, health food store because they were organic. So um, I sold them fresh when I pruned and I sold them dry. And that way they, they didn't go to waste. Um, so start with four crops. Try a cold room in the websites. Um, I scoured a whole bunch of websites. There were some very good ones talking about the differences between a root cellar, a cold room, uh, and of course, we all know what a pantry is like. Um, and um, freeze berries. It's fast, it's easy. Get them when they're cheap, get them when they're fresh, and you can do so many things with them. And if you start with just a few crops and you learn more about them, then you'll find that it's, oh, how did I ever think that was complex? It's all a matter of learning and time management. And you take your, your glass of, of uh, wine or like my chai um, and you go in the garden and you stand very still and you listen to them ripen. And you look at them and I've looked at them and then all of a sudden the penny drops, something I never saw before. And it's quite exciting, you know? Um, so here we have some really good 
good books and they're all available at the library. And um, I tried to give you a, um, a really good, broad choice. And um, they all have their ISBN numbers, so you can order them by the ISBN number. And um, this last one is really fun with Jane Reed um, because it just talks about British Columbia. Um, and we're, we have so many climates in British Columbia, even on Vancouver Island, we go from Mediterranean to tundra. So Reed covers all sorts of stuff. And here we have some good websites. So you can learn um, about them. You can learn how to build them. I love this one with the Amish uh, because um, I was surprised when I saw it. And I've, I've used every one of the methods that the Amish use um, while I lived in the city. And uh, so I reinvented the wheel. Uh, so this other one, uh, the method of green technology from Africa, you, I think you'll really like. And the flower, the flower pot fridge is also something that can be used on the balcony. But more importantly, it, it explains how to, you can, uh, I've got digging a large hole in the ground. Um, it, it talks about insulation and it talks about uh, primitive, uh, well, no, it's called intermediate technology. Um, and I've tried to give you choices, um, whether you live in an apartment, whether you have a house with a yard, whether you can change the environment um, around you or not, or whether you just kind of have to pinch hit. Um, and then um, uh, finally, the good cultivars. Um, my absolute favorite was Heritage Harvest Seed from Manitoba. Do check them out. Um, and they sell out really, really fast. Uh, so don't be afraid to order for next year. Um, this... Um, uh, 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 frangi seeds uh, is Italian and it has wonderful, wonderful seeds. And I um, grew them uh, for years. Um, um, and then, oh, this, this one with the homestead honey, it has a lot of uh, storage varieties in them, and um, some of them, as I as I note, I didn't I didn't use them or know about them, and um, so you can expand your knowledge. Um, what I showed you worked for me, and they might not work for you. Uh, and then, of course, the West Coast seeds. So that's uh, that's it. Um, I see we have some questions. What have we got going? Um, I started, uh, we've got time. I started seeds last fall around the beginning of October in Red Bluff, California. They sat and did not grow much during the winter. Okay. Um, now the cabbage radish turnip are only about four inches and are all going to seed. Why? Aha. Okay. Uh, First of all, you started your seeds too late. You really need to start your seeds if you're going to be growing winter crops um, in July and August. And you don't put them in the sun. You grow them cool. I always started my brassicas in pots and put them on the north side of my house, kept them in the shade. You let them grow slowly and develop, and then you set them out in the garden in September. Um, and they're going to seed now because they're biannuals. You put them out in October and they grew just enough, just enough, just, and then they were tender and you gave them winter. Well, now it's year two. So they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're going to seed. So get your timing right. We do have a 
a seminar on winter vegetables and we have a seminar on perennial vegetables. Take a look at that. Um, basement closet, partly underground. Oh, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, can you give an example of an overwintering onion for this area? Um, usually your walla walla is your overwintering onion. Uh, heard that one should wash the squashes before storing. <laughs> what do I do to wash squashes? Okay, um, we went over this, but I'll go over it quickly. Um, all you do is that you rinse them and dry them. So you just kind of get the dirt off and just rinse them. Okay, that's just to get the dirt off. Then you spray them with vinegar. That's what's important. That seals them, that drives out, like if you have those wonderful um, um, Elysian uh, pumpkins with all the warts on them, uh, the all the bugs love to get under it. You just spray all that uh, vinegar in there and then you put them out um, for uh, a day. And then if it's cool at night, bring them in. Um, and then you turn them over and you spray them and you do that for three or four days. Um, you usually don't have to spray them more than once. And then you'll notice that the skin gets very tough. So that's what you that's what you do. Um, you don't don't do soap and water. They're not they're not the kid on Friday night. Um, just rinse them and vinegar them. How do I know how much water is enough for each crop? Very good question and very hard to answer. Um, the soil, you first of all, not a lot of water all at once. The soil should be damp all the way uh, or very close to the bottom of the root area. So put your finger in and if it's damp, that far, then that's pretty good water. Um, the standard is an inch of water for an hour is enough. Um, your plants will do better with less water and more mulch. So gather the leaves, um, get some straw, get, get whatever you want. Um, give them a little insulation, mix some bark mulch in it, and um, then um, get that wet and then test your soil. Very, very easy. And you'll get the hang of it. And different, different areas of your garden will need more or less because drainage is not always the same. What temperature should a cold room be? Good question. Um, about 40 degrees um, minimum, um, 50 degrees maximum, and it depends on what you want to store there. Always have a, uh, a source of ventilation, whether it's directly to the outside on some of those, or, or it's just a good natural circulation. Uh, like under a porch, you'll find that there's natural circulation. Um, and that will be on the handouts as well. It'll talk about the differences in that. Um, the uh, cold room can, can go all the way down to about 33, 34 degrees. Uh, it's just stop them growing. The temperature of a pantry, um, now my pantry is maybe three degrees um, at max um, cooler um, because of where it sits. But um, often it's the same temperature as our house, but then our house is never more than 62 degrees. If you keep your house at 75, you're going to want your, your pantry a lot cooler than that, and you're going to want your whole wheat flour kept in the fridge. So um, think about that. Um, if you have a pantry that has uh, a window in it, um, that can be a source of circulation. Um, particularly if it has a door on it, because you can, you can regulate that temperature very easily. Just get a thermometer and watch. In all your storage um, conditions, your main enemy is great fluctuations in temperature. 
What about zucchini to dry or freeze? I've heard of people drying zucchini. I've never done it. Um, you don't, uh, if you're going to, you, you would have to blanch them. Um, so if you're going to blanch them, why don't you just, as I did, um, saute them lightly. Uh, and they're a lot more flavorful that way. If you blanch them, they're a very um, mild vegetable anyway. They just kind of fall apart. But if you saute them and freeze them, you'll find it's better. When you say squash varieties, don't cross pollinate. What does that mean? Okay, you have uh, three, three main species. Um, you have Pepo, uh, Maxima, and Muschata. And uh, they will cross pollinate. And so the seed uh, becomes a hybrid. And next year, if you save that seed, next year, you would not get the same squash. It doesn't affect what happens this year. It affects what happens to the children. So you, if you're going to save your seed from squash, then you, um, when, when you have one species of squash that begins to flower, you um, go out and you bag it with a screen to keep the pollinators off it. And you have the male flower and you go out and you, you tap each other together and you produce that squash and you mark that squash because once it's pollinated, um, it's fine. And that's gonna be your seed squash. And I used to do two uh, um, in case one failed. And that's, that's what you do. But if you're not gonna save your seed, it doesn't matter. Curious where to get the winter tomato. Go online, you can get something called Winter Keeper or Mystery Keeper. And um, Burpees uh, sells them. Um, They're not available West Coast seed, but you can order them. Just curious as to why you should not have manure with potatoes. Um, oh, why don't you have manure with potatoes? I'm supposed to remember why. Um, it causes too much um, top growth and uh, the tubers don't really develop properly. Um, I've already planted my tomatoes. Oops. Is it? Um, I kind of lost that one. I already planted them with. Okay. What perennial runner beans do you grow? Okay. Um, Painted Lady. Um, is it Jenny's horse bean? Jenny's Jenny's horse and um, Scarlet Emperor. Scarlet Emperor gives these big, huge purple and and, and uh, black pods that are exquisite. Um, Sadie's horse bean is uh, uh, white and it's smaller. And the Painted Lady is a got a beautiful flower. And it is kind of a medium sized one. So those all runner beans are perennial and you can tell because they twine in the opposite direction than um, a regular bean. Freezing tomatillas works well. Yes, it really does. Um, uh, did I take the freezing? I can't recall, I don't think. I um, Upstoot New York, we have uh, seeds and trees. Oh, yes. Um, I will do so. Thank you. Fruition seeds. Um, do check them out, folks. Always remember um, when you're getting seed from internationally that there are certain seeds that um, are prohibited um, uh, just because of certain diseases that are happening in certain regions. So. Um, don't uh, be sure to check out their sh their shipping options. Um, oh, Johnny Johnny Seeds um, is an old favorite in Maine. Um, how do I preserve yellow wax beans? I've tried blanching, but they always. Uh, but when try to reheat, they taste they're tasteless and chewy. Okay, do we have time? Yes, I'll give you the quick thing. Is beans are usually tasteless because they're overcooked, so they say. Uh, oh, blanch for a minute. Ah, right. Except 
The water's got to be boiling and they've got to be out of that water in about 30 seconds because they're going to keep cooking from the time that you walk them from the boiling water to the ice water. So that's why they're overcooked. Um, and uh, wax beans are a lot more difficult than green beans uh, for that. So the notion is you're not cooking the bean. You're just, you're just getting it in the hot water to stop the enzymatic action. And it's still cooking when you take it out of that water. So you've got to get it out early. You've got to get it on the ice and, and then throw it in the bag immediately take the air out of the bag and throw it in the freezer the faster you get it colder uh the faster you get it frozen um the better don't wait for the bean to cool down um although it's counterintuitive things freeze faster that are hot so if it's hot it will freeze faster so don't do a whole bunch just do enough to get them in the freezer and get them frozen like fast 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 and your wax beans will be better do you save seeds or does this not work? I have saved seeds for years. Um, and yes, it very much works. Learn the rules. Like we just talked about squash. Just learn the rules. Um, and the nice thing about saving seed is that we've developed these varieties over 5,000 years. Uh, the Greeks were the first ones to domesticate cabbages. The Turks were the first ones to domesticate carrots. Um, that's a lot of years of growing. All they did was that they chose the best ones. You always choose the best ones for the seed, the healthiest plant for the seed. And little by little, they adapted. It's, you know, it, evolution. Um, my sister grew um, a tomato that was absolutely fabulous. And I asked her what it was. She says, have no idea. It might have been an early girl 10 years ago. Um, but I've kind of forgotten, but it just, and this was not uh, um, the best place for tomatoes. It just adapted itself. And um, so, yes, it really does work. And when you buy these open pollinated seeds from these great companies like Frangi Seeds or Johnny Seeds, um, like Heritage Harvest Seeds, these people also um, save seed. and. They make their living doing this. And if their seed is no good, then they're out of business. So there's lots of motivation, but do save your seed. It's fun and it's worth it. And then you can go to Seedy Saturdays and trade. And that's always fun too. Um, what are your thoughts on trellising? Oh, yes, yes. You don't have to keep squash off the ground. Um, but if you've got kind of a wet sort of environment. I just used to put mine on stones or a piece of wood um, so they didn't rot. Um, I also trellised um, those uh, Canada crooknecks, right? And they would straighten out more. Um, so, uh, and then uh, one year um, in Powell River, um, the bear kept coming through and we had raccoons. So I grew them on trellises and they were up on top of the garden shed under a net and uh they were they were wonderful because the sun was hot and the animals couldn't get them um elliot coleman gardening books are the absolute best in the world if you really want to learn a lot read all his books um how do you grow walking onions i've had oh trouble walking onions are a perennial very small onion that um, you grow as a scallion and they're what's called a top set onion. So the seeds are on top and they're called walking onions because at the end of the year, the stalk um, uh, goes brown and the onion falls down and walks. So it spreads by walking. So you take that pop knot and you just stick it in the ground and um, that's it. That's how you grow walking onions. Um, I grew them uh, and, and they grow well in marginal areas. And I would grow them along my walkway or, or stick a few here and there in among the, the perennial beds. 
Um, and then I would pick them. You saw them in that one picture. I would pick some and then I would leave a few in the ground over winter and then they would give me scallions in the spring. Um, what zone are we in? Um, Vancouver Island goes from tundra down to Mediterranean. Um, so we actually go from um, two to nine B. Uh, and in Canada, we split our zones um, in five degree increments. So every zone is an A and a B rather than just the 10 uh, degree increments. Um, I'm in a zone seven. So I'm very close to the water, um, just a little south of mid island. Can you go over potato storage prep again? Um, can you freeze potatoes only if they're cooked? Um, uh, the we're getting short on time. Potato storage, you can read on one of the websites. Um, you cure them. Uh, in other words, you, and you've seen people just dig up the potatoes and they leave them in the fields to cure and dry out. And you do that 50, about 50, 60 degrees. And then you rub all the dirt off and you put them in cold storage. But that is easy to find. I love squash, but find it hard to peel them. <laughs> Well, you don't, it depends. Some squash you peel, some you don't. Um, uh, some, um, if you cook it, um, the peel comes right off. Um, you have to know what squash it is. Um, anything else? Is that about all of them? Did you do the perennial running runner bean question? Yes, we talked about, we talked about uh, perennial uh, runner beans. Um, they won't talk about perennial runner beans. They'll just talk about runner beans, runner beans. Um, because they're all perennial. But runner bean is different from pole bean. The pole beans and the bush beans are all annuals. So are we are we good? Oh, yeah, there's all the questions. <laughs> So folks, you might have noticed that I sent out the handout right away when we we're in the session. So I'm hoping to get the if all goes well, be able to get the video to you tomorrow or Thursday. And um, you can share it with your friends who might have missed it. And our next session uh, is growing herbs. <laughs> is growing herbs. Yes. May 1st by yes. Dorothy Caesar. Yes, and she's wonderful too. So we'll we'll um, send out the link for the, the next set of sessions. Thank you again so much for your patience with our slight technical difficulties. Joe recovered well, so thank you, Joe, for that. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention. We're so excited to be able to bring this to you and uh, learn alongside you. Any final words, presenter? Folks, um, good, good gardening. It is a sane way to live. And if all you can do is grow something in a pot, then by God, grow something in a pot and stay connected to your food. It doesn't matter how much you do. It matters that you do it. And so that's true. about it. <laughs> so true. And, uh, Joe, it was great that you uh, did talk about herbs, and I'm sure Dorothy will be able to bring much more information to uh, that topic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, they're, they're definitely a fave. <laughs> and we've got a great back catalog of previous sessions recorded, including ones by Joe. Um, so we'll include that in our link with the video. As well, if you can't find it, you can just also go to our website um, under learn and skills, there's gardening and you can find the back catalog there. There's lots of wonderful videos um, from our generous local master gardeners on the island. Thank you so much, folks. Good night all. Happy Good night and, and thank you. Thank you.